just want to welcome Mike Modest on. Mike, how are you doing today? Uh, good. That's good. That's good. Uh, you uh, you in town right now? Who, me? Yeah. Mike? Yeah, I'm in town. I'm uh, just working at my day job. Yeah. Oh. How so, you doing? Uh, oh, we're doing? We're doing pretty good. Anything new as far as uh, going on with you right now? Nothing new. Everything's uh -huh. pretty. Yeah, it's uh, basically hurry up and wait. That's, that's um, where I am right now. Are you are you under contract or what's no, the status? No, I'm not that? under contract. Um, when I went out there and worked for uh, WCW, uh, basically I was offered a contract, which I accepted. Um, I mean, I was told that uh, um, you know it was a done deal, and uh, no contract was ever sent out. Um, when when the uh, the new regime, I just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, a day late and a buck short, I guess. Um, you know, I I was told by the old management that uh, it was a done deal and that uh, um, I would be signing for sure. For It was a two-year deal. Um, and uh, then when the new regime came in, everything was like on hold. Um, you know, and so my contract never got sent out. So I've never, I haven't signed anything. I'm not, I am not under contract. I've spoken with uh, Terry Taylor and, and several other people from the company and and uh, basically, uh, what they've told me is that I'm just on hold right now, and uh, just uh, I've been told just to hang in there. Um, there's no answer, you know, as to whether or not they are going to honor the uh, the agreement or uh, or not. So I really don't know anything at this point. Do you know anything about about Christopher Daniels? Um, Chris is basically in the same situation as me, but I do believe he has a contract. Um, it kind of, it, it's kind of a weird deal. I, I was used on TV and I, and I think I got over pretty well. Um, you know, I, I was used on TV and I, and I didn't yet have the contract and, and Chris has a contract and he hasn't been used yet. Um, and, and Chris is basically, from what I understand, he's in the same kind of boat where it's just, uh, you know, right now, we're concentrating on the guys that are here that have been used. Um, you know, we we don't want to bring in any new talent at this point. So just uh, you know, hold on and, and wait. Oh God! Yeah, it's kind of a kind of a terrible uh, position to be in because uh, yeah, you're, you're when I went out there, you, what what's that? Perfect. You're in that limbo again. Yeah, yeah, it's the worst place to be. It really is. As far as your wrestling plans right now, um, do you, are you going to be doing some independent shows while waiting, or yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I've got some uh, some dates out in Pennsylvania for uh, Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling, um, you know, and then of course I, you know, I'll still be wrestling with APW, and uh, there's some other indies that uh, you know, just like little startup indies here and there, a couple down in Fresno and and around. So yeah, I'll be still working indies. Anything, anything been going on in the indie scene as far as um, you know, new companies that you've seen or that are that are looking good? Uh, no, not right now. Um, you know, PCW of course is is pretty good, but you know they're kind of a mainstay type. You know, indie they've been around for a little while now. Um, you know, and APW always looks good to me. But uh, other than that, uh, nothing that I I think actually looks really good. There's there's you know some indies with with money apparently, but. Nothing that I see that's really promising. I hear something about uh, something that's starting up, possibly like a, a minority league. Believe it or not, huh. yeah. Really? I hear about a, a league that may be like strictly um, ethnic, um, African American, um, uh, Latino, and uh, and Asian. Hmm. Yeah, I've heard. Like, like out, out here, out here, or like on the east. No, I, th I think that was going to be on the east coast, but um, you know, I'm not really sure. They 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 uh, they went down and, and looked at some guys in L.A. Um, and uh, they also looked at uh, one of the APW guys, uh, um, Tony Jones, who just got back from uh, Battle Arts. He, he went out to Japan and uh, wrestled for Battle Arts. And then um, also uh, they looked at uh, uh, Brown Bomber, Robert Thompson, and, and also uh, uh, Boyce Legrand out here. So they're you know they're looking for people right now, I guess. Uh, what did you do? You talk to Tony as far as uh, how he liked Japan and everything. Yeah, he loved it. He had did a great time. I think he only worked like twice. I think there was a some kind of screw up with his uh, plane ticket, so he, he didn't get out there 
um, you know, uh, in time for his first match. But uh, then he, you know, wrestled the second time, second two matches, and he, I guess he, you know, he was really over. And, and um, there's a real strong possibility he's going to be returning there for um, a lengthy tour. Um, you know, I guess he 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 was very over back there and and you know his mother's half japanese so he he understands japanese and, and speaks a little so you know he, he and plus with that shooting background and stuff i mean he just he fits right in over there i know it's always been kind of your goal to get over there is there any you know is there do you yeah. think there's any chance that you can go over like with him or something because yeah, i know I you, just, can, you can i just um i just was talking to uh beef wellington not too long ago and uh he wants to get me out to uh, michinoka and um you know of course i I'd, I'd love to go japan's always you know it's it's my favorite thing to watch uh, you know i like i like the japanese wrestling um you know especially like all japan and um so yeah you know i'm i'm definitely working on it and uh you know i'm, I'm going to be sending some footage to all japan as well well, you should work on that because if you could get in there, that would be, you know, that that'd be a great career. Yeah, oh, I'd I'd love it. I'd love uh, it. Let's back there. let's uh, start the phone calls. We're going to go to uh, Danny in Hawaii. Uh, you're first up. Oh uh, yeah, it's Darren. Darren, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, hey Dave, uh, it's about to say, I uh, love your show. I think it's really, really. I just was listening to you for like the past three weeks, I think, and uh, found you through uh, the Law, which I used to listen to, and I, I really, really liked uh, your interviews. I especially like that one that. Um, well, that, well, not an interview uh, in particular, but that one caller that uh, you're talking about that uh, wrestler that was put, the Japanese wrestler put in the hospital. Fukuda? Yeah, yeah, and he was trying to tell you, like, you don't know the story and stuff. Oh, no, that wasn't a Japanese wrestler. That was um, um, Jeff Peterson. Oh, sorry. Well, you know, and he was, you're, you were willing to recant your story if he just told you the, the real story, and but he wasn't willing to give it up. That wasn't that wasn't a fun that wasn't a, a, fun, a fun deal. That was like the only caller I think I've had in six months that actually like I just thought was really like oh god. You know, yeah, like, well, I totally agree with you on that. But uh, anyway, um, I'll have a quick uh, question. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but uh, I just wanted to know, as far as all your interviews that you've done, is what was the worst interview that you've ever done with either wrestler, promoter, or, or manager for that matter, and, and why? And then what was the, the what was the one that the you worst. would like to do but haven't done yet? I don't know. Um, God, like to do but haven't done. I don't know. I mean, there's there's people out there. You know, I want. I'd like to get Kurt Angle on the show. I mean, I don't know what you know. Um, I think get Jericho on the show. Just mm -hmm. some names that you know. I I would you know personally like to get on the show. I'm. I just don't. I don't really like of a. Um, you know, anyone that I would. Like you know, like I'm I'm dying to interview that I never have. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I remember like even one time I listened to the law and I think uh, 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 Donnie Abreu he was saying that uh, the Undertaker was really hard to do an interview with because he just doesn't break character. Yeah, I don't know if I would like to do the Undertaker even though he's a superstar for that because mm -hmm. it's it's too you know gimmicky. And I like to just talk to people like like people. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know as far as on this show, there's no one I would really. I, I will say that the most disappointing one was was Luthez because he wouldn't break character, and I've known him for so long. And he always does with me, and I think just the fact that it was like public to so many people, and it was you know I I I, I was disappointed in that one. I mean, if I had to pick pick ones on this show, right? Because um, that was like the first week I think we did the show, and and he was like one of the like maybe the third or fourth guy I had on. And I was really looking forward to it because. You know, he's been around forever and knows, you know, knows every story in the book, and he was just, he wasn't really very forthcoming. Mm. Is there a certain reason why, like, um, I, I don't, I don't, or have a hard time finding any, you know, website or anything that has anything from, um, you know, uh, Triple H or, or Steve Austin for that matter? Just, I mean, I, I mean, I've seen Steve Austin on, um, you know, like Conan O'Brien and stuff like that, but, you know, just a long, lengthy interview or something, you know, I, I know, like, The Rock's done a few. I'm just wondering, is there, like, you know, when they reach a certain status, they just prefer not to, or they're too busy, or is that what it is? They are really busy, um, and there are a lot of demands on their time. I mean, you know, Helmsley does, they, they, he's done some mainstream stuff, you know, inter, you know, things like that. Austin's done, Austin's kind of a shy type of person, actually. Oh. You know, um, as far as, he doesn't really, I don't think he really enjoys doing it. He'll, you know, he does it because it's, it's, you know, when it's necessary, whereas some people like, um, I think Mick Foley, maybe maybe not as much now because he did so much this year, but I think in the past I think he really got a kick out of it. Uh, and he may still he may still for all I know. You know, I'm just saying that like you know, then all of a sudden when you become a superstar the demands are like incredible on your time. Mm hmm Okay. Well hey, thanks for the time and I appreciate your show. I'll keep listening. Okay, thanks a bunch, Darren. Bye.
Okay, let's go to Andy in Los Angeles. Andy, how are you today? Not bad. How's it going, Dave? It's going pretty good. Hey, Mike, uh, I'd offer, I have attempted to offer my condolences on losing the big job, but, uh, well, considering who it's with, I don't know if I want to offer too much condolences. But maybe you can get back in there, or maybe the WWF will come calling. I want to talk about last night's show, Dave. Um, I would give it a thumbs up, uh, but I'll tell you, I had to agree with JR. That ending to the two Christmas matches really sucked, and it really took the whole... It was, that was, those guys put on a clinic. And, man, how could they come up with that finish? I don't Mike, did you, Mike, did you watch the pay-per-view last night? No, I sure didn't, Dave. You would have enjoyed it. It was... Um... Some real Dean Malenko and Scotty Tuhati had a tremendous match. Ben Juan Jericho had a tremendous match, but uh, I agree with Andy. Um, you know, it was a finish where they'd gone 15 minutes, done everything in the world to each other, and then it was um, Benoit off the top ropes with a headbutt, and uh, Jericho like pulls the belt in front of him, and Benoit headbutts the belt, and they just call a DQ on Jericho. So the ref had taken a bump; he hadn't seen the belt come into the ring. All he saw was the belt lying there, and he calls the DQ, and and every and and it, you should have heard Jr. Mike. It was that sucked. He just yelled it out loud, which is kind of ironic given they should on the booking committee in the first place. Well, I think that that was more because um, from the finish was supposed to be that, well, which we just and 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 what it looked like on the camera. If you remember well, the first time we saw it, you couldn't really see the finish, and I think that he was reacting to the fact that based on what he saw. The finish, it was just like a weak DQ. Whereas when, if you watch, when he watch, when he, when he sees the replay and the replay shows what it's supposed to be, he just goes, oh, I was wrong and, uh, the referee made the right call. I think that the, the suck was, was kind of like, you know, more of a reaction to, as it was going on, seemingly being, you know, really bad refereeing. Well, it was a pretty genuine reaction and I kind of had the same reaction. <laughs> the other funny thing that he said that I, that really struck me as ironic, well, Actually, before I just to get up, before I get off that match, did you? Lawler did a, a WCW move last night that was just smack of Heenan. Um, when Chris put the abdominal stretch on uh, Jericho, and he said, "I'll have a heart attack if he gives up to if he gives up to this move." Remember that? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jim Ross mentioned Wilbur right. Schneider. Yeah, it's like, well, that, not so much that, but just the fact that Lawler said, I'll have a heart attack if he gives up to that move. It's like all when, you know, it's like all those times in WCW where Heenan with the first thing when a submission move gets slapped on, oh, he won't quit. You know, it's yeah, like, I, 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 I always, I always hate when the announcers don't sell, don't, you know, yeah. you know, you know, Mike, what do you think as, as far as like a wrestler? Because, you know, you do a lot of, uh, a lot of Matt wrestling in your matches. What's that? I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, just as far as like, you know, the calling of a match, as far as like, you know, when you put on, say, like a like a, a leg lock or an arm bar or something like that, mm -hmm. it's like a near submission going for a rope break, and then the announcers, you know, use it as a comedy moment. Yeah, I, I can't stand that. And one of the other things, that, you know, that really disappoints me now is that everybody uses the submissions, like like the cross arm breaker and, and everything. They use it as like rest holds, and it kind of destroys the the believability of of the the move, you know. Um, it's one of the things that I, I think, you know, it's like Ric Flair really worked a long time to get the uh, the figure four leg lock over, and uh, now it's it's pretty much a rest hold well, in I think most matches when you see it used, except when Flair uses it. But, it, you know, it's kind of a shame because, uh, you know, you don't see a whole lot of sub submission wrestling out here in, in, in you know, the, the States. Well, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why is because the announcers don't don't sell it, and uh, they don't they don't put over the uh, submission holds. Well, also, I mean, it, 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 submission holds I think got killed by all of these stiffs in the '80s and '90s who you, who did use it as a rest hold, and people saw right through it. And submissions don't work in the era of extreme wrestling either. Who's going to submit when you're getting wrapped up in barbed wire? Um, the yeah. other thing, you know, go ahead. Um, you know, you, you, but you, you know, you. I, I know the point you're making, but you know, like in the in the Benoit Jericho match, mm -hmm. when when Benoit got that cross face on, that was uh, the crowd really came alive. Yeah, they really and, reacted to it. And, and the walls of Jericho also, when when uh, Jericho got the walls of Jericho back on. So, I think that if you get the move over. Uh, yeah. Now, if it's a move that the fans don't know and that the announcers don't know how to explain, yeah, you're right. It it, it's, it won't get over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing that was kind of ironic out of the commentators last night was um, Jim was complaining about Eddie Guerrero setting race relations or the image of Latinos back ten years by the way he talks because of that silly gimmick that they styled him with. Now he, again. He, he, he said he said that on the air. Yes. 
Wow. I, I caught it. <laughs> That's kind of what we were saying last week. I caught it um, as, as as Eddie was coming in because there was a lot of commotion being made. He, it was just when he was making his entrance and he was getting undressed for the match. And I thought, well, that's pretty ironic coming from a guy on the booking committee. <laughs> I'm now, amazed. He, he said, I mean, I remember when, uh, when Pat, did you, hear the, did you catch the line when Patterson came in? No, what did he say? I couldn't hear it. Okay, they had had, um, Patterson came in. Patterson came in when he did the run, when Pat Patterson Pat Patterson did the run in in the main event last right. night, and he just goes, "Oh my God, it's Patterson! He's right back from the parade." They had just had like a, a gay rights parade in D.C. Oh. that afternoon, so that's where that line was. And I didn't know they had. A, I, I kind of assumed it, and then someone like wrote me a letter and goes, "Oh, by the way, there was a gay rights parade that afternoon in D.C. that was pretty high profile." I couldn't. I could not understand what Jarrett said because the audience really picked up at that point. I was wondering. He, 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 I thought he said the party or something. It sounded like he took a swing at him. Yeah. The one thing that I thought was just a little disturbing last night was how badly the audience wanted Trish Stratus to go through that table. I mean, they were jumping <laughs> for it from the beginning. That's, they didn't want to see them wrestle at all. They just they could have just gone out there, just thrown her into the ring, have her go through the table and not have a match, and the audience would have been just as happy, which is kind of disturbing. How are heels supposed to get over anymore? If putting a woman through a table gets you a face pop, what, what, I, kind of, what the hell makes a heel out of you these days? Um, let's see, you put a baby face through a table, maybe. I don't know, Mike, what do you think? They put rock through a table. I think one of the, the one of the problems, you know, with a, with a lot of, a lot of heels is that they're not believable heels. They all have a cartoon voice, you know, and, and they, people don't believe that they're really a bad guy. You know, so when they see something happen, they know they know it was supposed to happen. It's it's like uh, you know we all loved Darth Vader when we were kids and watched Star Wars. Well, that's because we knew Darth Vader wasn't real. You know, and I think I think the uh, key to to getting legitimate heat is if people believe what you're doing is real and not supposed to happen. Well, the, the, you know what it is. I think the loss of jobbers really hurts because that was a great way to get a heel over was just kill a jobber, not pin him five or six times. You know, one two, pull him up. Without without you know people to thrash basically like like what the moon dogs used to do for that. But see even that to me, you know like when when I'm when I'm healing I see I I don't pick a jobber up because to me that's that's cartoon. If you're a real badass and you're a real mean person, you're gonna go in there demolish him, pin him as fast as possible, and just be in and out of the ring, you know. Well, and well, and and that's that's one of the things you know like. You, you started seeing like all all the all the heels they go for the cover one two pick the guy up you already knew it was coming you know it, it's no different than the heel going for the count one two and then the guy kicks out and now the heel looks at the ref and slaps the mat three times you know come on ref you know I, stuff like that just it gets so corny because they they just do it all the time it gets so overly used the thing is though when you talk about go in there demolish him get out that's basically Stone Cold Steve Austin as a face or a heel I mean if if there's no differentiation anymore between behavior and face and heel I don't know how you get either of them over to be perfectly honest. Speaking of which, he was looking pretty fat last night, wasn't he? Well, that's what happens when you're when you're laid up and you can't train. Yeah, I mean, he looked um, like Prince Albert with a shave, basically. I thought he looked like you know what I thought he looked like was Ron Harris. Okay. But much shorter, obviously. <laughs> and he was he was pretty sluggish too when when he was swinging that chair. It's like wow, he was really rusty. I said, you know, hopefully, I'm glad that they did it the way they did it. That they left the two guys to carry most of the match, and he was just out there for a minute, minimizing he had exposure. You know, he had to be looking back on it because, you know, he, you could tell he really couldn't do anything physically. They didn't, and he didn't get touched. Nobody touched him. They couldn't. They couldn't. I'm sure he couldn't. You know, he couldn't take a bump. I mean, you saw when he went down how much trouble he had to just getting up. Yep. So, uh, this is from Ben talking about last night's show. He says, although it was a, a solid show, I was disappointed. I was disappointed that other than Trish Stratus getting slammed through a table, there were no unexpected happenings. Everything the people wanted, they got. Last night's show was the closest thing to a wrestling show that WF has put on in a long time. Yeah, um, I was, you know, the, the lack of um, outside skits, and it was almost all in the ring, or 90% in the ring. It was, it was a very different feel to the show. But it worked because uh, it was good. It was, it was good. It needed good matches. I mean, a show like that would really fail with bad ones. And the guys, the guys delivered. Um, I actually, you know, after Trish getting slammed through the table, I thought was totally expected. I actually, I thought everything on the show was expected, but it was okay. Um, you know, sometimes expected isn't bad. In fact, I think that show, there was a lesson to that show, and that's what it was. Uh, how did you like Big Show's Hogan impersonation? I mean, it was comedy. It was pretty good. It was fine. Um, 
you know, it, it wouldn't have been good had it lasted much longer. He did it for two minutes, the pair, you know, and then then got on with they got on with the rest of the show. Uh, this is from uh, this says that Beyond the Mat is scheduled to be released June 30th all across Canada, which I was not aware of. Uh, let's see, Barry Thrill here says uh, the Hogan parody last night was quite possibly the funniest parody I've ever seen. Maybe because Paul White knows Hogan personally, but the WF did the camera work excellent by being behind White the whole time walking down the walkway. I felt like I was in 1990 at the Sky Dome. And uh, this is, in your opinion, which was a better pay-per-view, the EMLL pay-per-view on March 17th or Backlash? Uh, EMLL pay-per-view, you know, I was thinking about that this morning when I was writing stuff up. And EMLL pay-per-view was definitely a better show, I thought, than Backlash, because the main event was, that main event with Viano Tercera and Atlantis was so good. It was the match of the year. And Undercard, um, Undercard was, was maybe even, but, but just superior main event, just far superior main event. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is uh, regarding Paul Heyman. Why would Paul Heyman be furious about being offered a Tuesday night time slot on CNN as it has been reported elsewhere? Um, yeah, I, from what I gather, it's been suggested to him. Uh, he's balked at it, and I think the reason is is that um, he is under the impression that the WWF is going to go on TNN in September, that he's going to be getting kicked off, so why build up a new time slot on Tuesday only to lose it because at the beginning, general, not always, but generally speaking, switching time slots, you're going to lose some audience. And so I think that uh, it's like why you know rebuild the product from scratch. A lot of people have blamed Friday night for ECW's ratings, and they may be right and they may not be right because Roller Jam, and I checked into this, Roller Jam um, used to do two hours on Friday and then it switched to one hour on Tuesday and one hour on Friday. And the Tuesday never did the rating that the Friday did. And ECW, while the demographics are not exactly the same as Roller Jam's, they're, they're pretty darn similar. Uh, let's go to Dominic in Virginia. Dominic, you're up with myself and Mike Modest. How are we doing, Dave? Mike. Yes. Um, actually, I'm trying to figure out. I mean, you were saying that they're not going to use you because they don't know where to put you. But they no, can find no, no, Mike. No, no. Awesome, but they can find Mike Awesome and put him in right away. Or they're possibly going to bring in, you know, by Lance Storm and probably put him right away. Yeah, it's it's a little different. Those guys are, you know, what you would consider quote unquote name guys. Sure. Mm, um, you know, of course, they're going to listen to a guy like that, and they're going to, you know, they're going to talk to him and, and so on and so forth. Me, I'm just a little indie guy. You know, I've been working for uh, eight years now, and uh, I'm not really a name. Um, you know, so it's it's a it's a totally different you know situation. And and no, I haven't said that they aren't going to use me. In fact, they haven't said that either. All they've said is basically just hold on, just hang in there. Um, you know, they haven't really said anything one way or the other yet. Um, you know, it's it's really funny. I you know the guys the guys at WCW the the locker room atmosphere is incredible. It's it they're a great bunch of guys, and they have a hell of a lot of talent over there. Um, you know, uh, me and Chris Can Candido spent a lot of time together. Um, you know, we shared rent a car and everything. And and Chris and I have have a lot of the same you know beliefs about the business and and everything. And uh, you know, so I I really think it's a great company. And uh, you know, one of the other callers they called and said, you know, well, you know, I'd like to give you my condolences for not getting hired. And then again, you know, maybe it's the best thing that you didn't. You know, maybe maybe it'd be better if you went and worked for w, WWF. You know. Um, I've, I, you know, I, to be honest with you, I, WCW is always, you know, kind of the company I would, I'd rather work for, um, because of the fact that in the past, you know, they, they have been the company that, that does the wrestling. Um, you know, now WWF, it's, it, they're so full of talent right now. You know, when they got the, uh, um, you know, when they got Malenko and, and Guerrero and, and Saturn and et cetera, it, you know, I mean, they really, I don't think, are looking for talent right now. Mike, um, you can maybe see WCW still in a position where I think they can still use talent. Yeah, if you think, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, if there, I mean, there's very few people right now they could possibly work into, but in a way, a lot of, I mean, a lot of wrestlers, they have, I mean, I figure like your beliefs in wrestling are, you know, true and form, but how would you feel, how do you feel personally about David Arquette being the world heavyweight champion? Well, you know, I'd like to plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> I'd like to just say no comment. I dig where you're coming from. So that I can stay political. Um, you know, I, I see what they're they're trying to do. You know, they're trying to go towards that that entertainment thing that, that McMahon has done, you know, but at the same time, you know, McMahon has done the entertainment thing with guys like The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin and, and Jericho and, and 
you know, it's a little different than than just uh, you know bringing in David Arquette. You know, hey, I you know I don't know, teach his own, and and you know I'm sure the ratings will tell him whether or not they're going in the right direction with that. You know, I mean, they're they're not dumb guys. You know, uh, both Russo and Bischoff really know what they're doing. Um, you know, and and so they'll know whether or not they made the right decision. Also, uh, with the independence scene, just wondering, were you ever offered to work the uh, Grade Eight in uh, Delaware? No, no, I was not. Yeah, so that would actually have been a real good, fit, at least, I want to say a good fit, but at least would, like they did last year with Christopher Daniels, kind of bring someone that really no one ever heard before from outside the East Coast. I figured yeah. like that would be good for you. Cause I thought, yeah, there's a lot of indies out there that that I'd love to work for. Um, Wolverine Pro is one of them. You know, is another one. Um, unfortunately, you know, I'm kind of cursed being out here in California. You know, the airfare is, is so expensive. You know, I, I just, uh, you know, I can't thank Blaine DeSantis of, of Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling enough for bringing me out. And he's he's brought me out on a on a pretty consistent basis, and uh, you know, got it's it's really given me a chance to meet a lot of really you know great guys like Cheetah Master and and uh, uh, Lance Diamond or, or Simon Diamond. Um, you know, really great guys that I, I wouldn't have normally had a chance to meet and uh, and. Uh, be acquainted with. And I think with those guys, I mean, that like I know Cheetah Master is a very regular in ECWA, yep. and I mean, at least for me, it's only about an hour and fifty minute drive. So instead of the four hour drive to Pennsylvania, it's the worst. Yeah. But um, also, uh, final question. I mean, I mean, you were talking about Michinoku and possibly you know, battle arts in all Japan. I mean, you could you said you're like pretty much huge mark for Japanese wrestling. If you could have like quote unquote your dream match against someone in Japan, lightweight or headweight, who would it probably be? Masawa. Masao is like, I mean, I, I just watched that guy and he's amazing, man. You know, there's, there's a lot of guys back there though, like, you know, Kawada is, you know, awesome and Kabashi and, uh, um, Akiyama. You know, there's a, there's a lot of talent out there and there's a lot of guys that I'd, I'd love to get in the ring with, but I think Masao would probably be the one that, uh, that I'd most like to, to be able to get in the ring with. You basically say if you could ever do that, that would make, pretty much would make your career just one match against them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it damn near would. Um, you know, it's funny, it's like, uh, you know, even even with the WCW thing, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the type to, you know, uh, you know, cry baby about, about things because, you know, I'm, I'm just really thankful for the, the opportunity that they gave me. Um, you know, when, when I arrived in South Padre Island, you know, I was expecting to wrestle uh, Elix Skipper again. And I wrestled uh, Elix Skipper on, on the World Wide Show, and they used me as Mike Carrillo because uh, they, they, had, they didn't uh, research the rights to Modest yet. And, uh, you know, we had a hell of a match. And, and in my opinion, it was, it was actually a better match than my match against uh, the artist. Well, actually, but, most, uh, most matches will be better than any match against the artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he, he, the artist is a, is a hell, you know, he's, he's a good worker too. But, you know, I mean, you know, some people, they just click better with others. And, and, and Elix Skipper, he's, he's a hell of an athlete. And, and, uh, I think is he right now in New Japan? Because I know they got about four guys out there from WCW. No, he's 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 not. They got uh, Rick Cornell, Chuck Palumbo, and uh, Dan Devine are the three guys out in New Japan right now. Also, but, but he may go um, because they're saying different. I think they want to send different guys every month. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. And more. Hey, they need because with. I mean, pretty much Saturday night done. It sounds like done for good, and like and there's really no independent deal with uh, NWA Worldwide or Heartland yet. I mean, this is pretty much the only way for them to. I mean, any for any lower level guys to work right now. I think it's kind of sad in a way because really, at least worldwide gave him a chance to at least you know show. I would say show their stuff, but at least get the exposure somewhat, get matches done. I think I think WCW what they would really would benefit them is to open up an office somewhere like in in, in Oregon and Washington because it's so far away that nobody would ever see it, and send like a couple of veterans. You know, like WCW, like WWF did with Steve Regal, that kind of a guy. Um, you know, and they have law. You know, they also have Lawler, and you know, like or like like Cornette in uh, Ohio Valley, and have a couple of veterans that they're not using, but they're good workers. Uh, you know, kind of uh, work the main events and do the interviews, and then coach these guys and have them work. You know, five cities a week. You know, even if it's in front of only a hundred people, it's five cities a week. You learn. You know, you learn to wrestle. I think that that's that would really uh, speed up the progress because I think. You know, and Mike, you know, you you know, you'd be a good person to talk to this about. You know, it's like 
I mean, what, which, if you were able, because you've never, you've never really been able to do like a five or four show a week schedule. It's always been a couple weekends here and things yeah. like that. Don't you think that would really speed up your your progress and learning curve? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, that's that's one of the things that's helped me is is just you know having a ring so close. I'm I'm always in the ring, you know, working out. It, it is completely different, and it is a lot better to be in front of a crowd, um, you know, and, and have have that. But yeah, without a doubt. I mean. I just think I'd, I'd be so much smoother and, and even better, you know, than I am if I had that opportunity to work, uh, you know, three, four nights a week. I think WCW, the best thing for them to do would be, like, stay out in Southern California or Texas, where, if, like, they want to kind of rebuild the cruiserweight division because I think they're trying to level certain people away from that. Like, the Candido, he may have that belt for three, four months, and they'll jump up one more. At least they can pick up some luchadors out there and try to give them a work right now. Trying to, you know, even like well, adapting a little bit to the American style just so they can get used to it. You know, the one thing with WCW, though, is, is like realistically, if you actually look at the roster, they have a really good roster. They just have to make, there's just a lot of guys that are kind of like in a holding pattern that they need to bring into the mix. Are you, yeah, like a little over, basically younger, even like luchadors. Actually, they, they've, I, got, they, they've got some great luchadors right. out there. And, and actually, Guerreras is one of the best workers in the business. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know how good he's off from the injury, but again, he's in the Super Juniors. Actually, um, what is the deal with Psychosis? From last I heard of anything, he just wants to wrestle on Tijuana. He doesn't really give a crap what's going to happen with him, WCW. Uh, I don't know how it relates to WCW. I just know that, you know, he's wrestling Tijuana every weekend, and um, he's doing a big hair match on May the 12th with Rey Mysterio's uncle. And um, I haven't seen him in WCW in a while. I don't know if he's fired or... Or what the story is. I mean, I, a couple of weeks ago he came back, but they he hasn't been around. But then again, I don't know if they he no showed several dates, and then they didn't book him a lot as well. So I don't know. I don't know what that is. Don, we got to get running, okay? All right, roll off. Good night, Jack. Okay, thanks very much. Got a couple of email questions for you, Mike. Um, this is from Rich Hunt, who says, uh, "Who were some of the wrestlers that you patterned your style of wrestling after?" Well, you know, Mike Tanay, you know, it was funny, Mike Tanay came up to me after I wrestled uh, Elix Skipper and and uh, and also the artist, and, and Mike Tanay came up and he said, uh, you were a big Stevens fan, weren't you? And I said, yeah. He said, how'd you know? And he goes, man, I can really see it in your wrestling. So, I mean, that, it's, I mean, that's, that's one of them for sure, Ray Stevens. Um, and then, you know, I've just, I've always liked just the, the good physical, you know, wrestling. You know, I've watched a lot of guys like Mike Graham, uh, Bob Orton Jr., um, you know, a lot of guys like that, uh, even Terry Funk, you know, I mean, I, I watch a lot of the old, you know, older guys and uh, learn from them, uh, Roddy Piper, um, you know, I try to take a little bit from, from every guy, but I would say that the, if, if I patterned myself after anybody, it would, would be uh, Ray Stevens. I remember the first time I saw you wrestle, which was in San Jose, uh, it was many years ago, I just remember it was, in, it was a Father's Day but I don't remember the year, and and you were wrestling a you were wrestling a Max Justice, yeah. who um, as Mike Diamond at that point, yeah. And and I just remember it was like wow. I mean, I that was the first thing that popped into my head watching you, and and you've improved you know loads since then because that's many years back. Yeah. But it was it was very much a Ray Stevens you know kind of a Ray Stevens smaller heel you know that that you know wrestling because I saw Ray Stevens as, as you did yeah. wrestle a lot of real big guys. And, you know, it's funny about, like, talk about believability. I mean, I know as a kid, I saw Ray Stevens wrestle most matches against guys much bigger than him, and I never, uh, ever had that feeling that Ray Stevens wasn't going to come out ahead because he was smaller because of the way he wrestled. And he sold a ton in those matches. Yeah. But he was never, you know, you never got the feeling he was ever out of it, yet he, he you know, I mean, guy Ray Stevens, for people who don't know about him, was a guy who, could go in there with someone who was really one of the worst workers in the world, you know, kind of like a Bret Hart when Bret Hart was really on, mm -hmm. and make you think that, wow, this guy, you know, this guy's a really great worker. Yeah. One of the things, that's that's one of the biggest things, I think, in, in my style that, that resembles uh, Stevens is, is if you give a lot in a match and you, and you take a lot of bumps for a guy, when you do go over, you're beating somebody. Whereas if you go in there and pummel a guy and you're greedy and you want you want all the heat, and now you beat him, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. You haven't beaten anybody. You've beaten a job or is all you've done. Um, when I wrestled Elix Skipper, you know, he had the big comeback. He was tossing me all around, boom, 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 shot me in for a backdrop, gave me a really nice high backdrop, and shot me in again. Boom, I cut him off, took it home, got the quick cover, and that was it. 
you know so he was even though i went over he was still over as well you know it, it, it leaves the crowd with the impression well it could have really gone either way and so it really makes it look like you, you've beaten somebody it also makes you know it also makes the guy you know the guy coming close i mean i remember growing up watching san francisco wrestling and we we you know we had squash matches on television but they were not like the squash matches that when i would when i went to new york and saw their television mm -hmm. the new york squash matches would be a big guy like a, a stan stasiak whoever the heel at the time was come in and pummel a guy for two minutes i mean our squat quote squash matches would go anywhere from eight to twelve minutes on television and whoever the guy was doing the law you know the losing on the losing end, got a lot of offense in, and always got you know you know threatening spots and hope spots, and exactly. you know I mean you know like Mike, you know you probably remember Jerry Monty, the late Jerry Monty. Oh I mean, yeah, we saw him in. Listen. Yeah, Jerry Monty, you know like um, I mean we saw him in in many what I would call really good matches, but they were really tell you know he never he never went over almost ever. Yeah, Jerry Monty was the guy that actually originally broke me in, and uh, you know to the business and and. He's one of those guys, man. I've never heard anybody say a bad word about him. Um, he was just—he was—he was a great guy, and 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 he was a pretty good worker, and had a hell of a body on him, you know, in his younger days and everything. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd seen a lot of footage on him where, even though he wasn't one of the main event guys, you you wouldn't really know it by the way he looked and and by the way he acted in the ring. And and when he had that heel on the run, you, you would actually start buying it. You know what? This might be his night. You know, and and uh, and that's one of the things I like about Japan too is is they'll take a guy, a young kid, bring him in, and he'll job maybe for two years, but eventually he starts getting those wins. You know, and 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 you keep him you keep him over like that, and, you, and it adds a lot of credibility to you know to to the wrestler. You know, you know one of the things new I mean, all Japan just did in the last um, was last tour actually. That I thought was tremendous watching it was the I don't know if you've seen the tape of this yet but it was the the, the seven second win that Omori took out Omori beat up Jun Akiyama no, because it was a guy it, it was it was tremendous because it was a guy you know everyone knew Akiyama was going over and he just got beat and the way you know Akiyama sold the seven second loss it made it like you know you're probably thinking a seven second loss it's just like what a joke yeah he made it like oh my god you know I got beat in seven seconds and I, it was it was a great thing for the company because you know how that crowd often sits there for 15 minutes knowing no one's losing early. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so. I mean, that's that's awesome. You do something like that, and it, it comes across as, you know, completely unexpected. You know, and and, and that's the thing, man, they, you know, about the Japanese wrestlers. They, everything they do, it, it's just, it's so believable, everything. From uh, Mike, and it's um, from Rick Jones in Salt Lake City, who says, we've started a wrestling school in Salt Lake City and are aiming to start our first show in the summer. And uh, is there a way to get a hold of you to come in and work the show? Yeah. Um, you can call uh, All Pro Wrestling at 510-785-8396. Uh, and uh, give them a buzz. You can also call me on my uh, business line, 510-593-3615. Okay, that's good. Let's get to uh, Ryan in Wisconsin. Ryan, what's going on? Hey, Dave. Hi, Mike. How's it going? How you doing, buddy? Good. Um, I just wanted to ask Dave a quick question about something that I wanted to ask Mike a couple questions. What's with the, what's with Bob Ryder's or Bob Ryder's vendetta against you lately? <laughs> He's been going off on you so much. You know, the thing is about that is like um, I, I'm I'm kind of aware of what he's saying now because people keep emailing it to me. Um, I kind of. It's it's like I kind of like it because it, it's just like more publicity for me. But then if I were to respond, the problem is is then everyone's going to go, oh boy, you know, it's like uh, this cat fight between two reporters, and then it like lowers me to this this level that I I don't really want to be at. So it's like I just I would rather just watch wrestling and comment on wrestling and leave that other stuff like you know those guys can say whatever they want. You know, I was going to say you know I I think it's all a work. I don't think there's any heat between Dave and Bob at all. I think what they're trying to do is work their way onto a, a pay per view. You know, it's a big. Uh, it's a big <laughs> yeah, but I'm not I'm, I'm not I'm not like uh, <laughs> I'm not doing the angle very well. <laughs> you better give me pointers on either. <laughs> what? You're not like 100 pounds overweight, so you couldn't have a Madden Ryder feud against you. 
He looked too no, strong. I, I personally, I personally like Mark Madden, you know. So. <laughs> oh, I think he does a really good job. I mean, it's just funny because. I, like I'm not. I'm not talking business wise. I'm just. I just have known the guy for like 15 years. That's what I mean. Um, as far as, um, I mean, I think that, that, that as far as TV, I think Mark Madden's got a really quick wit. Um, he's you know he's still feeling you know he's still feeling his his uh, way around. It's it's very different to to internet commentary where you're doing a lot of smart. Than going on TV in front of you know five million people every Monday night on on you know the the flagship show. I mean he's he's I think he's doing well, but you know I mean he's you know he's improving. Yeah. Did you hear any of um? I'm sure you heard of a lot of um Russo's comments last week on on um, WCW Live. Yes. I actually listened to that, and as a wrestling fan, and I've always considered myself an NWA then WCW fan instead of a WWF fan, I was, like, totally appalled by some of his comments because I was like, I like the true wrestling, and I think for him to come out and say, oh, the, the title doesn't mean anything anymore, I would, I mean, and I'm a wrestling fan, let alone what the, what the actual workers must actually think about that because... If you don't have your top title, what what does your company stand for? You know, I I I you know I actually just wrote something the other day about this, um, you know, for for this coming issue, because somebody um, who who heard what Russo said and act, and agreed with it just goes, you know, it's just a prop, and and if you look at it and you know if you look at it and you don't really look at it deeply. You know, you would say, if you're an outsider who's not a wrestling fan, and, and it's just like an exa example, if you watch Wrestling with Shadows, and you kind of go like, wait a minute, what's all this about some, you know, fake title that they win and lose, you know, by the orders of the promoter? Why was he upset? You know, if you look at it that way, it, to, the, to someone who doesn't, who isn't really a wrestling fan, it is completely silly. But if you understand the psychology of wrestling, I'll tell you what, I mean, because I, I was thinking about this. Realistically, uh, on last night's pay-per-view, um, just as a guess, I'm guessing they probably did 450 to 500,000 buys. If there was no title involved in that show, I don't know if they would have done 300. So you're talking about that title is worth 150,000 buys at 30 bucks a head. So that's four and a half million dollars. That's what it was worth last night. It was probably worth. Uh, in fact, I actually figured this number out. It's probably worth 12 million four weeks ago at Mania if you took the title out of that four-way and figured what it would have drawn with or without it. So that championship is worth, you know, probably. I, I, I know over the course of this year, the WF title is probably the value of that title. Forget about athletic credibility, the economic credibility of that title. It's, it may be worth thirty, forty million dollars in a year, and for Russo to say it's not worth anything, um, that statement tells me. And I hate to do this. I didn't even want to talk about this in front of Mike because he's in a bad position. But I feel that that shows that Vince Russo does not understand professional wrestling. Maybe I'm the one who's wrong, but I look at. I'm just looking at it from a numbers and a money standpoint. Thirty, forty million dollars is pretty significant bread. That's what I was thinking too. I mean, and then you can even probably times that by two if you if you consider. And I'm not talking. I'm not talking house shows, and I'm not even talking TV ratings. I'm talking for 12 pay per views a year only. Factor everything else in, it's even more. Yeah, and then then look at who your actual title holder is, and you can probably multiply that by two because if you didn't have, if you put a Rock or an Austin up against David Arquette headlining a pay per view, which do you think is gonna? I mean, I mean, it just well, doesn't make any sense. I guess. I like well, also, 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 just talk about Rock, okay? If Rock did not have a quest for the title as the main storyline feud the last couple of months, or, or before Rock, or and actually between Rock, because because he did one before and after, you had Mick Foley in his quest for the title. If you didn't have that as your key storyline, I mean, what would Rock be doing once you know what I mean? Once you've you've exhausted the personal issues, which are of course a main part of it, that belt is 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 the ultimate issue. In most cases, every now and then a, a, a feud supersedes the world title, but that's that's rare. Yeah, I mean, I guess just hearing his comments and everything, it's like, I mean, he's saying that nobody wants to watch real wrestling. Well, if he's such a creative genius, he should be able to take a different approach to pro wrestling to make it unique to, to the WWF, and that would be to actually put on a strong wrestling. Granted, the WWF is getting more stronger in the wrestling, but if they really wanted to make a niche for themselves, they could be the wrestling place with strong storylines to back up the strong wrestling, where WWF has got the strong storylines backed up by fairly good wrestling and with some of the wrestlers. But I think that would be a niche for them to be able to go after. Granted, they've lost a lot of talent with Malenko and Benoit gone, 
but they have enough talent on that. I'd like to get, I guess I'd sort of like to get Mike's view, because he said he wanted to be more of, I mean, he's more of a wrestler. I mean, I guess I'd sort of like to get his views on that point. Yeah, you know, Mike. it's like, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying. It, you know, I think what Russo's trying to do is he's he's trying to really implement the entertainment value you know that that Vince has, has has implemented with WWF, and and I I understand what what Russo's doing. Um, you know I I don't I don't know that I agree with the David Arquette thing, and and I don't know that I agree with the fact that the title doesn't you know with with what he said about the title not meaning anything. Um, you know, but but I do understand you know what he's what he's trying to implement. But I you know I think it's important you know for for any booker to remember that there is a reason why people are not tuning in to Melrose Place and they are tuning in to Raw, and it is because of the wrestling. You know, Vince always likens his product to a soap opera. Well, yeah, it's a soap opera to an extent, but there's still athletic competition. There's still the excitement of who's going to win this match and the, the unexpected action. People still like to see, you know, like Mae Young getting slammed through a table and, and, and things like that. I mean, people people love to see the wrestling action side of it. So, you know, I, I just I hope that, uh, you know, that, that – you know, any any booker of, of any promotion, I, I would hope that they wouldn't forget what industry they're in, they're they're working for. They're they're not working for Hollywood specifically. You know, Vince always says, you know, well, we make movies here. Well, you know, yeah, to a certain extent, that's that's kind of true. But it's important to remember that you make action movies. That that you know, most of the storyline happens in and around the ring. Um, you know, so yeah. I, I don't know, you know, I, I, like I said, I, you know, I got to be real careful what I say, you know, but I do understand what, you know, where where Russo's coming from. I don't think he's actually saying that, you know, the wrestling isn't important at all. I, I would, I would, I would think he would realize that, that yeah, the, the in-ring product is still very, very important. Um, I, think, I think, I think one thing that um, everyone needs to recognize, and sometimes it's forgotten, is that there's a reason why. Guys have to go, you know, go to wrestling school, and and learn to perform. And sometimes we've seen it on on shows when you see people who are not trained to wrestle try to wrestle. It's not entertainment. <laughs> no. It's not entertaining at all. Not not one little bit. I, I heard some someone say one time that they really thought it was entertaining to watch someone go in in the ring that that wasn't trained and. Like for instance, one of the misfits wrestled uh, Doctor Death um, in a steel cage a while back, and yeah. someone, a friend of mine, was saying, "Yeah, you know, that was that was kind of uh, entertaining." And I said, "Well, yeah, it was kind of entertaining for you because he, he was an insider. He knew, he, you know, he knows the business. He, he works in the business, and so for him, it was kind of funny to watch this guy that wasn't trained go in there and, and try to wrestle a match with Doctor Death, but." But to a, I think to to someone that's not smart to the business or or doesn't you know really uh, pay attention to the business, I think for them to watch that, I think they're going to be like, oh God, what kind of crap is this? You know, my my kids can do this in the backyard. You know, I don't I don't see anybody. You know, I mean, there's not a whole lot of backyard promotions that are selling out. You yeah. know, so yeah, that was an embarrassing to watch. <laughs> yeah, that was awful. Yeah. Do you, do you ever make your way to the Midwest in any of your wrestling, Mike? Um, what states Wisconsin in particular? Or... Any, and like where in particular in the Midwest? Um, like anything in Wisconsin? No, I've never been to Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot of um, a lot of shows <laughs> shows in the area. I mean, I've caught some of the May or you know WCW, WWF, and ECW, but all the smaller promotion independents are are really bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, to, I mean, if some good workers come in, it'd be sort of nice to see. And I actually had a comment, um, I tried to call him last week, um, with some of the Phil Mushnick comments, Dave. Mm -hmm. I was actually at the ECW show that was in La Crosse probably maybe two months ago. And I actually went with my dad, and it was his first wrestling match that he'd, he'd been to probably in about 20 years. And I'm like, you know, I go. It's pretty pretty unique than what you're what you're used to because he went to you know a lot of the AWA stuff. He knew the promoters, and we went to a lot of those matches. I'm like, it's you know it's, it's different than that. I'm like, you know, I go, but I think you'll get a kick out of it. Well, where we sat down, 
across from us was a, a family, probably maybe 30 years old. The, the two parents were with their, I don't know, maybe 10-year-old kids. I'm like, if they last a half an hour, I will be surprised. The show started late. Dreamer comes out, and it was blank this, blank that. You know, this is the blankiest town. And they were out of there within, like, 20 minutes. And I think he had some valid points that some of this wrestling just isn't suitable. I don't know if 18 years old is the right age, but I think there's, there needs to be, I don't know if it's, we should ban them, but there should be some more parental guidance or, I mean, because I don't think these people watch ECW on TNN. They just saw all wrestling. Let's go down to the Civic Center and watch them wrestling. So, I mean, I think they need to do, if there's, you know, a warning, you know, this may, may be offensive to children under this, I mean, on the t- even or something. I mean, I think they need to do something like that. You know, Mike, you know, because you've been in, in, involved a lot with the APW as far as booking what's on the show. It's sometimes risque, sometimes when you're in high schools it's not. I mean, yeah. that's a real tough call, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, the, and depending on what community you go into, you know, different things are acceptable. And, and we've gotten a lot of heat, uh, you know, for we've even gone to schools where, you know, a guy so much as grabs a girl, uh, a valet's arm, and we've actually gotten heat from, you know, the, uh, the city and, and everything about it. So, yeah, it's, it's tough. And, and, you know, if I'm not mistaken, I, I think ECW does make it somehow obvious. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I, I think I heard someone say that they do put up a, a um, like a disclaimer, you know, outside where, where you buy the tickets, some kind of uh, um, thing explaining that, you know, this is an adult you know, um, oriented type, you know, thing, and and you know they're not they're not so bad that like teenagers couldn't go, but I, I would say definitely they're not you know real great for small children. You know, but it's funny I wrestled uh, wrestled for promotion down in L.A. and uh, they use a lot of uh, you know uh, porn stars and, and stuff, and there was this kid I swear he was probably like nine years old, and he had this uh, this Jasmine St. Clair shirt on, you know, and his parents like. You know, bought him Jasmine St. Clair videos and stuff. And I, oh, I just thought, oh Jesus Christ! You know, this next oh, Jeffrey Dahmer in the making. You know, I, I just couldn't believe it. And, and he's he's talking like a sailor. This kid's like f this and f that, and and uh, he's spitting and, and yelling. And I couldn't believe it. You know, so I mean, you know, it's one of the nice things about America is you got freedom of speech. You know, and and if if they don't like the show, they can they can leave. And I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, Paulie probably gave them their money back. You know, I mean. Paulie's a pretty fair guy, um, so I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they were, you know, totally out. Of, they got 20 minutes of uh, of wrestling, and then they probably left, got their money back, and took off. So yeah, I was like, oh, I made that call right because I mean, I'm just like, you know, I've like, I've watched enough tapes on it that I knew what to expect, and I was just like, oh man, they're not gonna last. Yeah, and I'm right, like, right. do it's really bad. Yeah, Ryan, we've got to we've got to head to a break, and also Mike's got to go because okay. uh, he's got to, he's actually supposed to leave a couple of minutes ago. Mike, I just want to thank you. Okay, okay, Ryan, uh, Mike, I want to thank you very much for uh, for doing the show today, and I want to wish you the best of luck. Are there any any dates you've got coming up you want to plug real quick? Um, well, you know, I've got one coming up uh, May sixth here at uh, Pacifica High School in uh, California, and uh, that's about it within the next uh, week or two. And then uh, we've got something coming up in Healdsburg, but I'm not exactly sure, you know, when what the date is. Um, you know, but APW is still uh, kicking strong and everything. And uh, well, anyways, Dave, I'll, I'll let you go. I know you got to go, but you know, I, I'd love to be on again because I, there's a lot of stories I'd like to tell. So, okay, well, you're welcome to come back anytime. Okay, take care, Dave.